Hello and welcome to New York City Atheist Live on Tape, brought to you by New York City Atheist Incorporated. I'm your host, Dennis Horvitz, the David Letterman of the Hopelessly Damned. It's Women's History Month, and I can think of no better way of honoring the occasion than by introducing our guest for today, our good friend Margaret Downey, the doyenne of the free thought movement. She's here to tell us how women outwitted the church in their fight for the right to vote. Uh, Margaret is perhaps best remembered as the recent past president of Atheist Alliance International, uh, which is the uh, National Atheist Umbrella Organization to which uh, American Atheists, New York City Atheists, Secular Coalition for America, and several other agencies, several other organizations are uh, affiliated. Uh, she's known for organizing the successful 2007 convention in Boston, uh, which I had the great pleasure of attending. Uh, it became known as the Woodstock of Atheism, primarily because uh, the writers who became known as the Four uh, Horsemen of the Apocalypse for Atheism, uh, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Christopher Hitchens, and Sam Harris were there. Um, and I guess that was, uh, they started being called the Four Horsemen after that event, so that was, that was a, uh, uh, very much a turning point, I think, uh, in the, the history of atheism. So Margaret is here to explain today how atheists can win the fight for freedom from, uh, from religion by uh, following the example of brave women uh, who fought for their right to vote in, the, in America in, uh, in the late 19th and 20th century. And she will be uh, wearing a, uh, an authentic suffragist's costume. I thought I'd flown back in time. Uh, the suffragist movement used tenacity, strength, and courage to stare down what seemed to be a whole world against them in the beginning especially the churches, and even the Bible was used to quote, uh, was quoted to use as justification against them. Um, so uh, they were arrested, they went to jail, they chained themselves to fences, they were force fed, but they never gave up and they won, and so can we. So today's presentation, uh, Margaret will uh, include authentic photos from the Smithsonian uh, from the Smithsonian Museum to show the 80-year struggle of suffragettes. Uh, she will tell how the movement was created, how divisiveness over religion came, to, uh, came into play, how religion prevented women from obtaining rights, um, and how the movement overcame their infighting that occurs in every movement, except ours, of course. We don't have that. Uh, she will also talk about why women still need to be freed from religion. In most atheist groups, she points out men outnumber women, though it is believed that women cling to religion more than men do. Uh, ironically, uh, Margaret points out, um, American Atheists was started by a woman, Madeline Murray O'Hare. She is now president of the Free Thought Society and is organizing a convention-oriented umbrella group called Unity, which she hopes will hold its first big event in 2013. And meanwhile, she is traveling throughout the U.S. and she's teaching atheist groups how to deal with the media. So I'd like you to all to join in welcoming our friend, Margaret Downey. The women who paid the fines were released, but most of the suffragists refused to pay the fine. A total of 16 suffragists refused to pay. They claimed that they were unjustly arrested for exercising their right to protest and claimed that they too had freedom of speech. They were sentenced to 60 days hard labor in Occoquan, I don't know how to pronounce that very well, Occoquan Workhouse. That's in Virginia. It's an Indian word. When the women arrived to the prison, 40 prison guards wielded clubs and went on a rampage against the women. The warden had ordered his guards to teach the suffragists a lesson. The wardens and the guards felt justified in abusing the women because they thought it was unpatriotic to picket the President of the United States, especially to picket in front of the sacred White House. They beat Lucy Burns, they changed, chained her hands to the cell bars above her head, and they left her hanging for the night, bleeding and gasping for air. The guards hurled another suffragist, Dora Lewis, into a dark cell. 
They smashed her head against an iron bed and they knocked her out cold. Her cellmate, Alice Cousy, thought that Dora had died. And Alice Cousa suffered a heart attack because of what she saw. Later, it would be discovered that the guards grabbed, dragged, beat, choked, slammed, pinched, twisted, and kicked all the women that were in prison that day. And that horrible first night in prison on November 5, 1917, was called the Night of Terror. For weeks, the women only had water to drink from an open pail. And they found their food was infested with worms and they were cold, and they were hungry, and they were isolated from the world. The world did not know what was happening to them in prison. The suffragists who were not in prison continued the protests and the picketing. They bravely held vigils, demanding that their comrades be set free. The suffragists continued to hand out literature, and more and more young people started to support the rights for women. The suffragists would not be silenced and would not be forced away from protest efforts taking place in front of the White House, even though it was a time of war. Suffragists and leader Alice Paul had not been arrested on November 5th in 1919. She decided to do something drastic. She printed what President Woodrow Wilson's words on paper, and then she burned them in a pot that the suffragists who picketed in front of the White House used to keep warm. That action was thought to be overtly unpatriotic, and it caused another riot in front of the White House. And during that riot, Alice Paul was arrested for obstructing traffic. She was unjustly sentenced to six months of hard labor and sent to the same prison, whose name I can't pronounce, <laughs> to join the other suffragists. After seeing the mistreatment of her sister suffragists, Alice Paul called for a hunger strike. The jailers were concerned that word would get out that the suffragists that were in prison were dying of malnutrition. So they devised a very terrible way in order to feed the, the women. And what they did was they forced fed. And in order to determine when the stomach was full, the jailers fed the women until regurgitation actually took place. And liquids such as raw eggs was poured down a tube until the stomach was full. And when the stomach was full, that's when you knew to stop. The women were tortured. They were tortured for weeks with this forced feeding. Because when the lips became damaged by the forced feeding through the mouth, the tube was placed inside the nose. And then when the nose was damaged, it would go back to the mouth. The tube caused tremendous damage to the throat, the esophagus, and the stomach. And forced feeding is torture. It did not help matters when the suffragists who did not approve of picketing the White House during wartime started calling themselves the law-abiding suffragists. It made it seem like the suffragists in prison actually deserved to be there. So do you see how important it is for everyone concerned to be aware of mistreatment especially for those who are fighting for your same cause. Finally, Alice Paul was able to smuggle a message to the press. This mistreatment and the forced feeding were finally highlighted in the Washington Post. So finally, the world discovered what was happening to the suffragists in prison. The public outrage over the mistreatment pushed the district court to overturn all of the sentences. The arrests were deemed invalid, and in total, 200 suffragists had served time for obstructing uh, traffic. Even though the subject was very serious, 
Some cartoonists made light of the situation. And on the screen, you see a very rare cartoon showing a fat suffragist in prison refusing to eat. So when she loses all her weight by refusing to eat, she can fit in between the prison bars and go escape and return to fighting for women's rights. The ratification banner was beautiful. It had rows of stars and the colors of the golden yellow, white, and purple, which was adopted by the suffragists back in the early 1900s. President Wilson finally addressed the Senate in 1920 and announced his support for giving women the right to vote. The Tennessee vote to ratify the 19th Amendment hinged on one vote of the 24-year-old state senator by the name of Harry Byrne. Now, he had originally voted against the ratification. Senator Byrne changed his vote after his mother urged him to do so in a telegraph, uh, telegram message, which was delivered to him just minutes before the final vote was cast. And her message said, would you deny your mother the right to vote? <laughs> Even after his vote, anti-suffragist rallies were held, and anti-suffrage state legislators actually left the state so that the legislative quorum could not be achieved. But the Tennessee ratification had met the 36 states, and the constitutional amendment was finally ratified. On, October, on August 18, 1920, Alice Paul, national chairman of the Women's Party, received the greatest news via telephone. The 19th Amendment, just as Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote it in 1848, was finally approved by Congress and signed by President Woodrow Wilson. Alice Paul made the announcement to the waiting crowd of the suffragists and the supporters by unfurling the ratification banner from the balcony of the National Women's Party headquarters. The women marched in the streets of Washington, D.C. with the banner, and soon celebrations spread all over the country. Women and their supporters were overjoyed. The 80-year fight was over, and finally women had the right to vote. And that was something to dance about. <laughs> this was a great accomplishment and a wonderful move towards equality for women. But the fight is not over. Women are still not paid equally as men, and some women aren't even considered for some jobs. Now, we're very close to total freedom here in America as compared to other countries. Women around the world are still suffering from religious dictates that stifle their freedoms. Now, while some women actually choose to live their lives veiled in a burqa, and they're abiding by their religious dogma that demands forced marriage and subjugation. But some women want to break free of that. There's no easy answer. But knowing the history of women's suffrage is very helpful. Just as the women's suffrage movement started as a dress reform, so should maybe we help them demand their equality by starting with the shedding of the burqa, only by those women who want to be free of their religious di dictates. Because I realize that some women who wear the burqa do so because of modesty, and they have special meanings to the veiling of their body. I think these women have every right to express their religious beliefs, but wouldn't it be wonderful if those women who wanted to wear bloomers, I mean, you know, slacks, be allowed to wear them instead of the burqas. Now that would be freedom. And if you want to help bring freedoms back to Islam, especially to the women, we must first help them break free of the burqa. Someday I hope to see the burqa become a costume, just like this one. <laughs> And someday I'll give a speech about the burqa. Now, I hope that this presentation causes you to appreciate the courageous women who bravely fought against harmful traditions, authority, and religious dictates so that women could have more rights in America. And let's start a discussion now. Um, but first I want to tell you one of the reasons that I am proposing 
a non-theist, atheist event, or you know, however you want to say it, non-theist, humanist, so many words, <laughs> free thinking event in 2013. It's the 100th anniversary of the women's suffrage parade. And the struggle for women's rights is very similar to the struggle in which non-theists are currently engaged. Non-theists are a disrespected minority. Non-theists are misunderstood, were hated for no good cause. And that hatred comes specifically from Bible dictates. Now, just as the Bible was used against women, the Bible is being used to condemn and scorn the non-religious community. And similar to the women's movement, the non-theist community is fractured and splintered over minor, minor issues. Some non-theists advocate that we do not attack biblical teachings. And other non-theists advocate that we move forward with lawsuits and we publicly scorn the Bible and organized religion. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> I just highlighted how Elizabeth Cady Stanton's writings in anti-Bible stance frightened so many in 1848. The fracturing was overcome, but it took 80 years for women to realize the big prize was for equal rights. And obtaining the prize was accomplished through cooperation and unity. Non-theists may disagree with certain actions and words being used to combat religious dictates, but the overall prize for us is to obtain equality and acceptance. The time has come for the non-theist community to realize that the only way we will rise from being a despised minority is to show that we have big numbers. So a very large public gathering on the doorsteps of our politicians will work wonders. Now imagine what the public would think if the media shows up for our gathering and shows it in a positive light. Now we have an opportunity to plan for a 2013 event which will gather together the members of all national groups. A 2013 Unity Event Committee has been formed and we're bantering around ideas on a chat group in Yahoo and on Facebook. The committee is trying to problem solve, and believe me, we have some major problems to solve, but please become a friend on Facebook and send me your ideas and suggestions. Don't blame the sin, blame the sinner. <laughs> so, you know, it's up to the uh, people who interpret the Bible to interpret it with a, a, a better heart and, and less, uh, less uh, prejudice and bigotry. You can't misinterpret most of the Bible passages that tell um, that you know uh, non-believers are like sticks that be, should be thrown in the fire. You know, is is that a dictate that you could take metaphorically? You know, what is the fire? What, what does that stick mean? <laughs> no, it means that you know we're not wanted, we're not appreciated, we should be burned, uh, and you know non-believers going to hell and infidels and, and heathens, you know. Um, I think you should blame the Bible. I really do. Uh, and the followers. Yeah. And their followers are very dangerous. I just told my husband uh, a couple of days ago that I decided I have a new speech idea. It'll be my Halloween speech. And it's going to take a cult, a very scary cult. And I'm going to learn all about that cult. And I'm going to present it on Halloween because that's the scariest thing I can think of is a religious cult. Sorry, I'm having so many questions. <laughs> why, why do you think Utah was one of the states that gave yeah. the right to vote? Because this is, yeah. that, that, that surprised me, because they're even today, I saw the like ACLU uh, um, notes saying that this woman had killed her, they were trying to kill her, uh, abort her, her uh, baby, you know, and uh, and she was thrown in jail or something because because she tried to do that uh, by by hitting herself or having yeah, some pleasure or something. Mm -hmm. And that, 
That's so, I mean, they, they, those people are bizarre when it comes mm -hmm. to women's rights. I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, I'm not um, a scholar, mm -hmm. um, so it would be interesting to go on the internet and, and actually dissect, you know, how this happened in each, in each state. Um, by the way, uh, the book that inspired me to do this, oh, the projector's on it. I was going to hold it up. <laughs> um, it's Annie Laurie's book. Um, and if you're so inclined to get it, it's a huge book. It's all about um, no gods, no masters, women without superstition. And it's very well written. There's some flyers here about how to order it from the Freedom from Religion Foundation. So while you're telling them, please do the 2013 Unity event, you can order a book. <laughs> it's $25. But it's very well written. And you'll get to learn a lot more detail about many women who were in the movement that made it work. That's what I think. Why did they always dress in white? I mean, that's virginity, right? Well, you know, um, it's, it was a, a way to stand out because women had been told to wear dark clothing for a very long time. And this was a, a way of being bright and open. And, and almost, um, they, they tried to make women, if you notice in some of the pictures, women almost had this uh, goddess look to them during that parade. And they focused on the fact that, you know, we are, we, we, you like to look at us, <laughs> but give us the right to vote, you know. And I think that, that theme of that Grecian theme went through that entire parade. Do you have a question? Well, first, uh, I would posit a possible reason why the Western states tended to be a little more uh, quick to give the vote, having lived in Colorado most of the time. Um, the, there's, first of all, you have a much more sparse population. And women had to be far more self-reliant out there than they did here in the East. Because you had you know, loads of space. And, and if you've ever worked on a farm or anything like that, you know that women are not just sitting in the house. They are like all over the place. And they work as hard as men easily. So you know, I suspect that in the West, it just made more sense. You know, they, could, they, could, they had to acknowledge what women were doing much more so than here. Um, now my my question my question to you is um, the the thing with the bloomer uh, lady uh, Ms. Bloomer um, I'm just curious as to how much biblical wrath she got because you know in the Old Testament it's like women shall not wear oh, clothing, clothing is outlined you know yes. so I mean talk about it I mean it's a direct religious statement right. it's not you know, that's mm -hmm. a biblical statement about why you can't and I'm, you know it's kind of interesting how did she get over that hurdle, how did they? How did they basically compartmentalize and ignore a piece of the Bible? Well, they, some women didn't. Some women had actually thrown away the Bible, knowing that it was going to stop them from progressing. So, Bloomer was one of them. You know, she didn't accept that. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, unacceptable. She rewrote the Bible, leaving all the uh, hatred against women out. You know, just like Jefferson wrote his Bible, mm -hmm. leaving all superstition out. Mark, the states that gave women the right to vote before 1920, did they allow them to vote in federal elections as well, or just the state and local rights? State, yeah. yeah. And, and like I said, some of them, it was only like for schools. So they were very, you know, given certain abilities, which they thought the poor little girl probably couldn't think any further than the school election. <laughs> well, she has, a, she has a direct connection to the kid in the school, right. whereas everything else, what does she know about land? Yeah. Um, the other thing that, uh, if you don't have any of these, uh, this is provided by the Freedom from Religion Foundation. Uh, I get them for free because I'm good friends with them. Uh, it's why women need freedom from religion, just a trap that condenses it very quickly and um, you might want to just pick some of these up, have them available if you have uh, some need to distribute them somewhere. I want a whole bunch of them. <laughs> uh, I could probably give you a bunch. So it's a very good little book. Yes, I find it very interesting that every woman in this room is wearing slacks except for you. <laughs> it's a costume. So those bloomers really took on. <laughs> yeah. You know, I almost lost my job. I worked for an insurance company and they did not allow women to wear slacks to work. And I um, was one of the first to show up for work wearing slacks. And they sent me home. 
And the next day I came and I circulated a petition that women should be able to wear slacks. They confiscated the petition and I almost got fired that day. <laughs> so I kept coming back and coming back, wearing, you know, daring them to fire me. Um, and uh, one time I was called into the office of my superior and, he, and I had on a beautiful pantsuit that had the, the jacket came all the way down to my knees and it just, you know, tied right here and I had slacks on. And he said, you have to go home and take those slacks off. And I said, I don't think I need to go home and take the slacks off. And I just let the slacks drop on the floor in his office and he was mortified. He was, oh! I said, I'm just taking, I'm just doing what you said to do. Taking off my slacks. And there I was with my long jacket that looked like a dress that was way too long for the time. Because that, at that time, there were mini skirts. Now I look ridiculous, you know. And I used to say to people, the reason you won't let the file clerks wear slacks to work is you like it when they bend over and file your files. I get it. So it took about five years, but I got the insurance company to uh, accept slacks. Uh, they didn't fire me. They wanted to fire me later for my anti-smoking position. <laughs> and my demand for personal time with children. And I have good news for you. My husband still works for the same company. And everything I wanted back in the 70s is in place now except for one thing. I had demanded in-house child care. Because I, I really think that women need to have their, and women, we all need to have our children in a safe place. But that's the one thing that has never been adopted by my big plan that's uh, 40 years old now. <laughs>